in April 2016, a schizophrenic with a shotgun fired at five people inside a Kensington Row House, leaving three of them, a mother of three, and two 46-year-old men dead on the floor. Christine Cromiak, Kenny Stowe, and Edwin Capone LeBoy. For LeBoy, this was the end to a tumultuous life that was scattered with arrests and near-death experiences and all the trials and tribulations that come with the street life. Capone, they call Edwin LeBoy in the Badlands. A North Philadelphia corner hustler with nine lives. He survived an assassination attempt when a notorious hitman sprayed bullets from an AK-47 into his car. He lived after gang members kidnapped him and tried to pull out his teeth with pliers. Capone's name echoed through the streets of Philadelphia for nearly 30 years. The streets and police will remember Capone for his gang activity in the late 80s and throughout the 90s. During this time, Edwin Capone LeBoy and his crew called themselves the ATT Gang. LeBoy had, had the letters tattooed on his arm. LeBoy was arrested dozens of times. In 1999, he was tried for murder in a death penalty case. Prosecutors accused him of shooting a member of a rival drug crew, 16-year-old Michael Torres, eight times while Torres was in the driver's seat of a parked car, court testimony shows. Eyewitnesses at trial, including the victim's sister, identified LeBoy as the killer. But Louis Savino, LeBoy's lawyer at the time, said that jurors found reasonable doubt in the testimony of those witnesses. LeBoy was found not guilty on all counts. During Kareem Hogan's murder trial in 2013, LeBoy testified that participating in that case could have consequences for him in the streets. He did, however, give a statement in that case and tried to walk it back at trial, which helped convict Hogan. The very fact he was able to return to the streets of Philadelphia goes to show you that the old saying, snitches get stitches or ditches, isn't always true. And how lucky LeBoy seemed to be throughout his life when it came to escaping death. In 1992, LeBoy was at a nightclub owned by two brothers who were gang members from 18th and Wallace Streets. Apparently, LeBoy and his friends got into an argument with the owner's sisters, and he took things a step too far. He makes the fatal mistake of slapping her in the face in front of everybody. The brothers later recruited a woman to seduce LeBoy, according to police records. When the two went out on what he thought was a date, the brothers abducted LeBoy, bound his wrists and ankles and face with duct tape, then tortured him throughout the night, according to police records. One brother had a pair of pliers. He broke off maybe half a dozen of LeBoy's teeth, breaking them into pieces. When the police drove to LeBoy's hospital room to check on him, his captivity had left a mark. Anytime he smiled or talked, you see his teeth, said Brian King, a retired Philadelphia police officer who patrolled Capone's turf for years. And they were a bloody mess, said King. In July 1998, Jose de Jesus was convicted of first degree murder for the 1997 shooting of a 26 year old Carlos Martinez. The evidence produced at trial established that De Jesus and Edwin Capone LeBoy had an ongoing dispute in June of 1997. On June 19, 1997, Capone and several acquaintances allegedly opened fire with firearms on De Jesus' house in Philadelphia. Sometime before 8 p.m. on June 20th, 1997, the very next day, De Jesus noticed a man who apparently looked very much like Capone and was wearing a bandana on his head, driving a new, blue Toyota Corolla that De Jesus knew to be owned by Capone in and around De Jesus' neighborhood. At around 8 p.m. after having observed the Toyota driving in his neighborhood, De Jesus entered a light colored station wagon parked in front of his house and exited the car carrying an AK-47 assault rifle. De Jesus then went into the abandoned house at 2913 Pelthorpe 
and ascended to the roof of the building. About a minute later, the Toyota Corolla rounded the corner of Cambria and Pell and Pellthorpe streets and began traveling on Pellthorpe past the abandoned building. Upon seeing the car, De Jesus opened fire on the vehicle and his driver, strafing the rifle from side to side and spraying bullets up and down Pellthorpe Street. Unbeknownst to De Jesus, Capone was not in the Toyota Corolla, but rather the car was being driven by Carlos Martinez, to whom Capone had apparently sold the car that very day. Six of De Jesus' shots scattered the car's windows, and one shot struck Martinez in the back. Martinez eventually died from the wound. This is what faced LeBoy had he been in the car that night. After being shot in the back, Martinez attempted to exit the car through the driver's side window, but became too weak and eventually, and eventually lost consciousness, so that his body was slung partially out the window with his head almost touching the ground. Philadelphia police officers who responded to a radio call regarding the shooting found Martinez lying on the ground next to his car, bleeding heavily from his chest. Police transported Martinez to Temple University Hospital, but Martinez was pronounced dead within a half hour of arriving at the hospital. An autopsy revealed that a bullet struck Martinez in the back, traveled through his kidney, spleen, stomach, liver, and inferior vena cava and exited under his ribs on the right side of his abdomen. The cause of death was determined to be massive bleeding from the wound. While De Jesus was firing, a man who had been watching his car nearby heard the shot and thinking that that was the sound of good firecrackers began walking towards the noise. Upon seeing that De Jesus was firing a rifle into the street, the man turned and began running in the opposite direction but was struck by one bullet in his left calf, two bullets in his back, and one bullet in the left side of his head. He continued running towards Cambia Street even after being shot. At the same time, a 15-year-old boy was riding his off-road motorcycle on the, on the street in front of the residence and carrying a three-year-old boy as a passenger. When the older boy heard the gunshots, he was startled and fell while still seated on the bike and holding the child. He covered the child until the gunshot stopped. But when the older boy later returned the child to his mother, it was discovered that the youngster had suffered a gunshot wound to his left knee and one to his left foot. Both the man at the car wash and the young boy survived their wounds. Following the shooting, police recovered 16 762 cartridge casings from the area in front of the home, all of which were determined to have been fired from the AK-47. In addition, six bullet holes were discovered in the Toyota Corolla that had been driven by Carlos Martinez, three in the driver's side of the front hood of the car and three on the roof. After evading police custody for approximately three months in September of 97, De Jesus was arrested when members of Philadelphia police fugitive squad surrounded the house that he'd been staying and detained him there. Following his arrest, he was transported to the police station where he gave a statement to police. De Jesus admitted his involvement in the shooting, explaining that Capone had shot at his house the day before and that when he saw the quote Capone wagon, he lit it up because he thought Capone must be coming back again. Edwin LeBoy's time on earth was full of moments like this. He played a cat and mouse game with life. He lived dangerously, selling drugs, being on the given and receiving end of countless shootings, murders, kidnappings, and torture. Those who knew him said James Elijah Dixon was pretty sensitive. He couldn't take jokes or taunt him very well. He suffered from mental illness, including schizophrenia. It was that taunt and testified Levi Almonte that touched off the April 17, 2016 massacre in, Kensin in a Kensington Row House that left three dead and Dixon, 45, charged with their murders. Neighbors on the 600 block of East Westmoreland Street in Kensington woke up to heavy police presence on their street after three people were shot to death. Around 3 o'clock in the morning, 2.40, around there. And I heard like five or six shotguns. Police say the 46-year-old suspect called 911 and told them he shot someone. But when officers arrived... He indicated that he was not about to let the open the door and allow the police inside. 
Uh, at that point, the 25th District de personnel declared a barricaded situation. Police say they negotiated with the suspect for about two hours over the phone before he surrendered, but not before he fired shots at a SWAT team on the roof. Inside, police say they found the man's brother, another man, and a woman all shot in the head. Leslie Suarez says she knows the suspect and says police told her he asked to speak with her before he surrendered. He sent the cops to look for me because he wanted to talk to me. He wanted to give up, but he wanted to see me first. We, we didn't know why, why he was going to tell me or nothing, but the police told me just they used me as to take him out. Suarez says she never got the chance to talk to him, but she never imagined her friend doing anything like this. I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to see what he was going to tell me. Maybe he was going to tell me the story. Maybe he was going to tell me something, that he was innocent or something. Police say a fourth victim in all of this was shot and wounded. Police say he was shot in the arm and he was able to escape from the home and he was found about a block away. He was taken to the hospital. Trial testimony portrayed Dixon, who served two terms in prison for a 1994 rape and robbery and a 2006 sex assault and burglary as a man struggling with paranoia, convinced that the people in his house, including his cousin, were going to kill him. The shootings took place during a get-together involving alcohol and drugs at Dixon's house that stretched into the pre-dawn hours. A group of six, including Dixon, LaBoy, LaBoy's son Zion, Dixon's cousin Alv Alfonso Liverpool, Kenny Stowe, and Christine Chromiak. Levi Almonte and another man gathered at his house tonight of April 16, 2016. The group drank alcohol, smoked weed, and PCP. They knew each other, but besides the family members, no real bonds besides getting high drew the group together. Stowe and Dixon argued throughout the night. Dixon at one point had a transgender partner over. The pair went upstairs for about an hour and then Dixon's date left. As the night wore on, witnesses said Dixon was increasingly taunted by Kenneth Stowe, culminating with Stowe calling Dixon homophobic slurs. Witnesses said that at about 3.30 a.m., Dixon came downstairs from the bedroom carrying a camouflage covered 12 gauge shotgun. Dixon approached Stowe and shot the 46 year old man in the face. Dixon then fired at Zion LaBoy, 25, wounded him in the left arm as LaBoy struggled to get out the front door. Witnesses said Dixon then followed LaBoy's father, Edwin Capone, into the dining room and shot him in the head. The final victim, Christine Chromiak, 33, was shot to death while trying to find cover in the kitchen. The other three people escaped, including Levi Almonte, who was able to testify at the bench trial where Dixon's main defense was that he believed the others, mainly Kenny Stowe, were trying to kill him. Eventually, Dixon was sentenced to three consecutive terms of life. At the right side of the courtroom gallery was nearly filled with Chromie X and Stowe's relatives. Capone, it appeared, went unrepresented by family or friends. But about six miles north, where LeBoy spent his life hustling, plotting, surviving, conspiring, a handcrafted banner hung on the porch of the house where he died. Capone in red and black marker. Gone, but never forgotten. YouTube's not really fucking with my channel right now. And these videos aren't monetized. If you want to help support STV Philly, you can join my Patreon. There's a link in the description for that. You can even cash at me for a one-time donation if you like. Just like and subscribe, that always helps the channel as well.